breaking news this morning. Some of you might have seen it. If you didn't, let me tell you. HGP Nightly News is reporting. Let me read what they are, are reporting. That a sergeant of the Guyana Police Force was recently arrested and questioned at the Miami International Airport in the United States of America over, quote, his direct involvement, end of quote, in the drug trade in Guyana. The policeman's cellular phone was also confiscated and his U.S. United States visa revoked. The sergeant was put on the next flight back to Guyana. As not who, the sergeant who was put on the next flight back to Guyana has not reported his arrest and phone seizure to his superiors in the Guyana police force. Sources familiar with the arrest said that the United States authorities, quote, are well aware, end of quote, of the cops' direct involvement in the 4.4 tons of cocaine, which has been found in four makeshift bunkers about 30 minutes from the illegal air strip in Region 1 on September the 1st, 2024. Other sources told Night News that the cop acts as a conduit to the Colombian cartel, other serving members of the Guyana Police Force, and other top officials who have been implicated in the 4.4 ton of cocaine discovery. The co court, the Colombian cartel has every presence in Guyana, especially in the interior locations, end of quote, the source added. In recent times, several ranks of the Guyana police force have been stopped and questioned and questioned by United States authorities. Their cellular devices were also confiscated. More tonight on HGP Nightly News at 8 o'clock. More tonight. So this is breaking news this morning that a police sergeant who, according to what the reporter said, traveled to United States, Miami, on his arrival, they say he was arrested. This is not... They would say, let me read it back. I don't want to misquote this. what the article is saying. On his arrival, right, they kind of say, yes, direct involvement in the drug trade in Guyana. The police are they're accusing of having direct involvement in the drug trade in Guyana. They said the cellular phone was also confiscated and the United States visa revoked. The sergeant was put on the next flight back to Guyana and has not reported his arrest or phone seizure to his superiors in the Guyana police force. That is what we have. And this is the same police force that Gail Tishere and others, this man, I can't remember his name now, Crandon saying is the best police force in the Caribbean and people, uh, the other Caribbean forces are, are, are trying to emulate what is going on in the Guyana police force. This, this is, thing is terrible. This is terrible. Police sergeant and of course you had a police superintendent Caesar. Same Miami. Same Miami. He was detained. They didn't say arrest. They used a different word. They say he was detained and questioned. I don't think they said that his visa was revoked. And the question is why? And remember I said, and I will continue to say, you know, if I were in their position and a man who is passing through Miami airport is detained by the federal authorities, questioned at length, his phone seized, and then he's sent to Guyana. When he reports to me as the commander, he has to come in his bare the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, in coordination with the DEA Georgetown Country Office, successfully conducted two intensive training Police courses Department, on basic and advanced Open narcotic investigations from November 4th to November 15th, 2024. The, the training, hosted by the Guyana Police Force, was attended by 35 officers representing several key agencies in Guyana, including the Guyana Police Force, GPF, Guyana Defense Force, GDF, Guyana Revenue Authority, GRA, and the Customs Anti-Narcotic Unit, CANU. The training was made possible with funding under the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative from the U.S. Department of State's International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs Office at the U.S. Embassy in Georgetown. This collaboration highlights the shared commitment of both countries to strengthen law enforcement capabilities and effectively combat transnational narcotics trafficking. This initiative underscores the DNINL's ongoing commitment to working bilaterally with Guyanese law enforcement partners. Participants receive comprehensive instruction on critical topics such as case management, 
deconfliction, surveillance, intelligence sharing, as well as key information on regional and worldwide drug trends. In addition to the classroom instruction, participants engaged in hands-on practical exercises designed to enhance their operational capabilities. These exercises focused on interview and interrogation techniques, surveillance operations, briefing and presentation skills, and link analysis chart training. This training exemplifies the power of collaboration between the DEA and our Guyanese counterparts, said Denise Foster, special agent in charge of the DEA Caribbean Division. By enhancing our collective expertise and operational readiness, we are better equipped to confront and dismantle narcotics trafficking networks that threaten the safety and security of our communities. At the training's closing ceremony on November 15th, Ambassador Toriot gave remarks and presented certificates to the participants. She highlighted the exercise as a significant milestone in the U.S. Guyanese partnership to combat transnational drug trafficking and address shared security concerns which, if left unaddressed, could harm Guyana's economic growth and investment climate. The AFC notes that this PPP government is on a path towards the covering up of the massive corruption of the Guyana police force. Predictably, its leaders are selling the falsity that the Guyana police force is substantially professional and largely that everything is hunky-dory and that the opposition is only mischievously exaggerating events. The AFC, on the other hand, wishes to point out that there is a method to this madness of the PPP's approach, which is going on in the Ghana police force. The continuation of low salaries for our policemen in a time of major revenues from oil has a political logic about it and bears a relationship of the workings of the PPP's corruption. The police force is crucial to the regime's survival, and the Guyana police force's officers are charged with maintaining civil order. Civil order to be kept necessarily means preventing anti-corrupt government protest, and oftentimes the persecuting of activists of the opposition. It also includes driving as much fear as possible so that criticism and dissent is neutralized, are neutralized. A police force will do these acts either through great commitment to the government or because it gets good compensation. The communist Leninist tradition of the PPP government informs it that no private rewards can be provided directly out of the treasury, which is a legitimate and right form for increased salaries, is that should be done. The easiest way to compensate the police for their loyalty is to give certain favored officers and rank and file free reign to be corrupt. Pay them so little that they can't help but realize it is not only acceptable but necessary for them to be corrupt. Region 5 has recorded an 86.4% increase in serious crimes from January 1st to November 11th, 2024, when compared to the same period in 2023. This was disclosed by Regional Commander Assistant Commissioner of Police Curly Simon during the launch of the region's Christmas policing strategy on Friday. The region had one murder in 2024 when compared with none last year and one in 2022. Over the past two years, there were no reported cases of armed robberies, but in 2024, 14 cases were reported. What I would like to see is for it to stick right at 14 and not increase further, Simon said. Other forms of robbery have seen five compared to two for the corresponding period over the past two years. With respect to burglary, in 2022, three cases were reported while in 2023, one case was recorded by in 2024, police have investigated five cases. Regional Commander Assistant Commissioner of Police Curly Simon. Rape has shown a slight increase with nine being reported compared to eight for the corresponding period in 2023 and 16 for that period in 2022. According to the commander, Mondays and Wednesdays are the days when most criminal activity takes place. We know that Rosignol is one of the high commercial areas. Cotter Tree is developing into that same fold, and at the Burbice Bridge, we need to manage the affairs of persons 
traversing to and from, because crime is not static to any geographical space. Addressing the issue of narcotics, Commander Simon pointed out that the region is a transshipment point for narcotics, moving from Region 6, East Burbese Quarantine, to other parts of the country. Comparatively, last year we had 22 incidents of serious crime from this same period as of 41, seeing an 86.4% increase. It is not a nice reading, but we were able to curb it. As it relates to traffic, there were 14 deaths on the roadway for the year thus far, when compared with seven for the corresponding period last year. However, the commander noted that during the Christmas period, there are going to be increased activities on the road both commercially and with vehicular traffic and pedestrians. He says people need to take extra precautions. Christmas is a time of celebration for most Guyanese and our intention is to minimize the incidence of crime through mitigating policing measures, minimize traffic congestion through effective traffic management, and to provide a safe environment for all citizens commuting within the region. Additionally, we would like to foster close relationships with with members of the public through consultation and cooperation. Simon concluded police record 86.4% increase in crime in Reg 5. The door to be broken. I'm going to go close so you can see what's going on. This is the height of the water over here. Yeah, yeah. So you can see what's going on here. You see all the water high over here? You take a look over that side, what's going on. So in a few hours from now, we'll have tremendous problem over that side. The cocodor is broken. Um, there's no control of the water coming in and it seems that we have very high tide here right now. Um, if you take a look, you'll see the, the rate at which the water is pushing to go into the village. Hello, good morning, Mr. Critty. Talk to me. Hello? Hi, I'm hearing you. Talk to me. Um, the, to the call of a call just now about Beto, LBI, NDC. It is so true what they're doing. Um, they're taking long, long to come and pick up garbage and another thing. Since local government election, the chairman them only come around one time in four years. We haven't seen them back until this Who's day. the chairman? Not the same anyway. one we get shoot the other day? No, not he, Sheik's answer. He get throw out. They throw you out. When we had to vote for councillor, they come in at your ears and tell you, don't vote for he and don't vote for that one. Vote for this one. Now you vote for them and you put them in them and come in and do nothing for Central and South. They're doing where they live in, the chairman and the vice chairman. Anyway, tell the caller what call just now. I hope he's listening. The vice president coming at Better Hope Community Center this afternoon, 5 o'clock. Everybody invited to go and hear their concert. They have to come out and speak. This is real nonsense they're doing. They're looking after we. He needs to shift up the Better Hope NDC. Um, Better yeah. Hope, more than anywhere else, I get a lot of complaints about it. I don't see Better Hope falling yeah, apart. Critic. But I don't know if the yeah, people of Better Hope just miserable or. Better hope no, falling apart. No, I ain't been in the road in a long it's time. True. I ain't been in Better Hope a long time. The central dirty, the, the south dirty, nobody. When they get one time in two months, when they got their people coming for clean drain, how they dig it out, they left in it on the road. Nobody ain't doing nothing All right. central. And this is a PPP stronghold. Roger that. They, vote, they come in around and come and beg you for vote. All right, I hear your concern. I welcome criticism. It doesn't bother I have a thick skin. It flows off like nothing. It doesn't bother me at all. Because if you can't accept criticism, you're sitting in the wrong seat. I have had journalists, very seasoned, experienced journalists, coming up to me and saying to me, Mr. President, I'm sorry for something I said in the past without any justifications. And it doesn't bother me. I've embraced persons who are highly critical of me. Because the only thing I'm interested in is this country. The only thing I'm interested in is results. I don't have, none of us have a long time in the space that is called art. What will define us 
is how we utilize the time we have here. How we utilize the time, and I'm fortunate to be given part of that time in service to my country at the highest level. And I intend to make this short time, 10 years maximum, in service to the Guyanese people come. And to make it come requires me to give more of myself, to be selfless in this endeavor. So when people ask me if you don't sleep, I don't. Because this country and what is required of me from this country requires me to be on it all the time. And as long as I have that strength, and if I don't have the strength at any time, I will not burden the country with my inability. So, I would say that constitutionally I have a mandate that I'm executing. I don't, I don't mind criticism. It doesn't bother me. I, all my life I've gone through that. Trace my political career. Right? Yeah, and you know you had a front page with me one year this morning. I went through all the tender process three times. It was the highest tender for a property three times. And so I, I, I've had that, Marcel can tell you. But I've never thought about it because at the end of the day, your result is what matters. What you're able to do matters. And people see through this. People know who do hard work and who don't do hard work. So um, I don't have to handle criticism because I accept it as part of life. So I don't have to exert energy on criticism. You see, if you start allowing criticism to bother you, you'll exert energy. You'll be stressed out. You'll worry about what people say about you. And that takes away from a positive mindset. That takes away from defining a path to success. That takes away from building a mindset to succeed. Because what you'll be doing every day is thinking about what people will say. How can you make decisions if you worry about criticism, if you're being critical of it? Every decision you can find something to criticize. If you get married to the best person in the world, you'll find 10 reasons to criticize. If you, if you wear something that you think is the most beautiful outfit today, you have people out there who will be critical. If you throw up weight, they'll be critical. If you put on weight, they'll be critical. But don't allow it to bother you. Focus on what matters. What matters is results. What matters is getting the work done. And in this world that we live in, you know, we sit down here and develop 2,000 memes in one second. That is the world that your children will grow up in. This is a new paradigm. And if you allow these things to bother you, if you allow these things to shape the way you think and the way you behave and the way you react, then you will let other people define you. You will lose your ability to be analytical. You will lose your ability to make conscious decisions. Because unconsciously, you are making a decision based on how people will think or perceive. And that is how I approach this. The non-governmental organization, Blossom Inc., on Friday told the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, IACHR, that there are increased cases of Venezuelan migrant women being victims of sexual and gender-based violence, mainly in three interior regions of Guyana. Blossom Inc.'s founder, Dr. Iodel Daljadi Dean, told a thematic hearing requested by the Guyana Equality Forum, GEF, that there has been a sharp increase in such incidents, totaling 307 from 2020 to mid-2024 with a significant influx of migrants fleeing the social, economic, and political crises in Venezuela since 2020, she said the escalation in sexual and gender-based violence was pronounced especially in Region 7, Kiyuni-Mazaruni, where 174 cases were recorded. 
Dr. Daliti Dean described Region 7 as a hot spot for exploitation and trafficking of Venezuelan females due to the transient population and limited law enforcement presence. The Blossom Inc. official also said that forensic interviews conducted with 41 migrant children between 2020 and 2024 showed the intergenerational impact of violence. These children, many of whom were direct victims or witnesses to acts against their mothers and sisters, often exhibit trauma related symptoms, further complicating their integration into guidance. Society. She told the IACHR hearing alongside other GEF representatives, Ms. Kainja Tom of the Diana Sex Workers Coalition, and Twinkle Paul of Society Against Sexual Orientation Discrimination Diana. In her response, Minister of Governance Gail Teixeira informed the IACHR that in 2023, the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security provided assistance to 363 victims of trafficking and gender-based violence a significant portion of whom were non-Guyanese individuals. She said there were now an estimated 40,000 Venezuelan migrants, about 5% of Guyana's population. She later said the manager of the gender-based violence at the ministry has confirmed that no report on case information about the 174 cases in Region 7, as reported by Blossom, has been shared with the Ministry of Human Services. She disputed Blossom Inc.'s account, saying that the United Nations agencies that are part of a government-led multi-agency coordinating committee has reported sexual violence against migrants here. There have been no reported incidents of sexual violence against the migrant population by the unbodies that have been operating within the migrant community, she said. The governance minister, however, reported that there were 13 Venezuelans and one Cuban reported domestic violence, resulting in four charges and nine investigations. On my first day back in the White House, I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration and begin the largest deportation operation in American history. No country can sustain what they're putting us through. And we'll start with the bad ones. And you know who knows the bad ones? Our police forces, our local police forces. They know them all and they know them by name. I will also use Title 42 to end the child trafficking crisis by returning all trafficked children to their families in their home countries, and we'll do that immediately. Venezuela was engaged in a variety of orchestrated cyber operations targeting Guyana, according to Assistant Director of the Guyana Defense Forces, GDF, National Defense Institute, NDI, Dr. Sion Livius. The NDI said in a statement that in a hard-hitting expose on Venezuela's orchestrated cyber operations targeting Guyana, Dr. Livius unveiled the faces, names, and organizations behind the malicious campaign to undermine Guyana's sovereignty over the Essequibo region. Using high-definition visuals and intelligence, the NDI said Dr. Livius detailed the tactics employed, from disinformation campaigns and ransomware attacks to phishing schemes aimed at destabilizing institutions. That there be no doubt, Diana knows exactly what is happening, and we are not defenseless, Dr. Livius said, underscoring the nation's superior countermeasures. The NDI, an initiative of President Arfon Ali established in September as an independent teaching entity at the University of Diana, held its inaugural Girl CEO cybersecurity workshop that brought together leaders from Diana's critical infrastructure sectors to address the urgent need for robust cybersecurity measures in the world's fastest growing economy. A key highlight was the presentation by Colonel Sheldon Howell, chairman of the NDI's advisory board and director of the National Intelligence and Security Agency, NISA. The NDI said Colonel Howell provided practical insights into the policy, implementation, and governance of national cybersecurity. Drawing on his extensive experience, he emphasized the need for a cohesive national strategy to combat cyber threats and highlighted the critical role of public-private partnerships in building a resilient digital infrastructure. His pragmatic approach offered participants a clear roadmap for translating policy into action. Opening the workshop, NDI Director Dr. Randolph Persaud delivered a vision for the Institute's strategic mission positioning it as a transformative force in Guyana's defense landscape. The National Defense Institute is more than an entity. It is the cornerstone of our nation's resilience against emerging threats, Dr. Persaud asserted. His address set the tone for an impactful day of high-level discussions and actionable insights. President of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Kester Hudson, 
praised President Ali's visionary leadership in establishing the NDI and emphasized the importance of cybersecurity for Guyana's private sector. As the fastest growing economy in the world, Guyana must lead in cybersecurity innovation to protect its economic future, he stated. Stephen O. Williams, a leading authority on cybersecurity and data privacy in the Caribbean, led the keynote presentation and an interactive tabletop simulation. As the executive director of Sulile Technology Solutions, Mr. Williams conducted a dynamic exercise simulating a ransomware attack on the Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation. This simulation engaged participants in crisis response and decision-making, highlighting the real-world implications of cybersecurity breaches. Muriana McPherson, Director of Cybersecurity at the National Data Management Authority, NDMA, delivered a detailed presentation on government policy creation and management. She provided a walkthrough of how cybersecurity incidents can be reported to NDMA and showcased tools and resources available through the NDMA website including guides for incident reporting, threat management best practices, and access to the Cybersecurity Response Network. Christopher Lawrence, a Diana-based information security expert, concluded with a session on corporate security best practices, emphasizing actionable steps for CEOs to fortify their organizations against cyber threats. The workshop underscored the NDI's commitment to fostering a robust cybersecurity culture at all levels of leadership in Diana. By equipping CEOs with the tools and strategies to address modern threats, the Institute continues to position Diana as a regional leader in digital defense and resilience, the NDI said. And I have been saying from that time that what needs to happen is that we need to have a proper investigation. You know, people have been calling all over social media. Some of the other people have been calling for charges to be laid, they say charge of murder uh, should be filed because the evidence is there. I am not sure that the evidence um, is there. And I'm saying that in a matter of that nature, you need to have a proper investigation to gather evidence because jump on charge is good. Satisfy the public that you have charged. But do you have evidence to even get past a preliminary inquiry to get evidence? Because the, the information is that the police, um, this um, the Nobriga fellow, Christophe the Nobriga, shot and killed um, Quinlan Bacchus in a particular area. The statement, of course, the police issued two statements, two a conflicting statement. Now the first statement issued by the police cooperate communication unit said that um, basically that the man was seen in acting in a suspicious manner and they put the police challenged him. He ran and defied the police. They returned shot, fatally injuring him. And then later on, I think within a few hours of that, another statement was issued to say this was an operation. And um, during the course of this operation, this youngster was shot and killed. So right away, you had some credibility issues on the part of the um, police in, in, in the release and in the account of what transpired. So that was on the 10th and shortly thereafter. We know from the reports and the, in the media, social media included, that villagers were out every night protesting or demonstrating or having vigil, whatever you want to call it. Every night they were out on these schools doing that. So it comes back to the question that you asked, what type of intelligence operation was being done by the uh, police, especially the special branch of the police? I don't know what was done. Um, can you, do you want to, 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 to make any comment at this point? From, from my observation, if we go back to the crime scene, very little was done in terms of protecting that scene that you must protect the scene until you finish with it i did not see an inch of tape at the scene so very little was done in justice nigel niles on wednesday instructed the state to pay 24 million dollars for the unlawful killing of quindon bacchus which occurred on june 10th 2022 at haslington east coast demerara ecd Bacchus, a 25-year-old father of one of Golden Grove, ECD, was gunned down by a team of police ranks. The incident was first described as an undercover sting operation by the Guyana police force, which led to a shootout with the deceased and members of the GPF. The police claimed that Bacchus was going to sell an undercover officer an unlicensed firearm 
and after he revealed himself as a police rank, Bacchus started to flee and in the process, discharged several rounds at the police. The police claimed that they subsequently returned fire, fatally hitting him. However, investigations revealed that there was no authorized police operation in that area and no police commander was aware of such. Further, examination of the firearm allegedly recovered at the scene revealed that the firearm the police claimed Bacchus used to shoot at them was inoperable and could not have been fired by the deceased. There is also no civilian witness who saw Bacchus fire at the police. As a result of the incident and subsequent investigation by the police, several Ranks were allegedly placed under close arrest one of those officers. Lance Corporal Christoph de Narberda was charged with the offense of murder and has since been committed to stand trial in the High Court. Two other policemen, Lance Corporal Thurston Simon and Cadet Officer Damian McLennan, were charged with attempting to obstruct the course of justice. Lance Corporal Simon was also charged with the offense of conduct prejudicial to good order and discipline. A post-mortem report noted that Bacchus died from multiple gunshot wounds. Government pathologist Dr. Nihal Singh in that PM report revealed that Bacchus received six gunshots and also confirmed that he was shot five times to the back and once to the chest. He had left to mourn his family and friends, including his three-year-old son. The circumstances which led to the death of Bacchus caused great public outcry, protests, and the temporary lockdown of certain areas of the country. The mother of Bacchus filed an action against the state for the unlawful killing of her son. This action was filed by Dexter Todd and Associates Law Firm. The state first defended the action, denying liability for the killing and claiming that Bacchus died during an authorized police undercover operation. However, by letter dated July 24, 2024, the Office of the Attorney General wrote the attorneys for Bacchus' mother, as well as the judge, indicating that the state has accepted liability for the brutal shooting and requested that the court court decide on the quantum of damages to be granted to the estate of the deceased. The court invited submissions from both sides and subsequently made its decision. The judge found that the brutal killing of Bacchus breached his right to life as protected under the Constitution of Guyana. The court indicated that it looked at recent matters of a similar nature and considered the settlement and judgment amounts in those matters before making its own decision in this case. As such, the court ordered that the state pay to the estate of Bacchus the sum of $1 million for his funeral expenses, $22.5 million as damages for the breach of his right to life, and $500,000 in costs. Kiter News, ExxonMobil Guyana Limited, EMGL, the operator of the Stabrick Block, recently announced that it has achieved the milestone of producing 500 million barrels of oil from the block since production began in December 2019. In a statement on Wednesday, the company said, oil production will generate tens of billions of dollars of revenue and significant economic development for Guyana. According to Exxon, since first production in December 2019, more than US $5.4 billion in oil revenues and royalties have been paid into the Guyana Natural Resource Fund. The Stabroke block is estimated to hold some 11.6 billion barrels of oil equivalent. The U.S. oil giant holds 45% interest in the block, while its partners Hess Guyana Exploration Limited and CNOOC Petroleum Guyana Limited hold 30% and 25% respectively. The 2016 production sharing agreement outlines the distribution of revenues generated from the Stabroke block between the oil companies and Diana. The deal allows Exxon and its co-venturers to recover up to 75% of production costs before the remaining 25% is shared between Diana and the Stabroke block partners. After accounting for the 2% royalty cost recovery and profit sharing, Diana's total take from the oil produces 14.5% of the total value of the oil. Advertising opportunities, the Stabrook block. According to information from the Bank of Guyana, BA, and government reports, at the end of 2023, Exxon and its partners recovered over $18.4 billion. Cost recovery for the Stabrook block has shown a steady increase over the years, rising from $633 million in 2020 to $1.9 billion in 2021, $7.4 billion in 2022, and $8.3 billion in 2023. In the government's 2024 mid-year report, it was revealed that $7.5 billion was recovered by the oil companies. This will take the total revenues recovered by Exxon and its partners to about $25.9 billion. 
Notably, ExxonMobil, Hess, and CNOOC have committed nearly US $55 billion to develop six government-approved projects within the Stabroke block. The first three projects, Lisa Phase 1, Lisa Phase 2, and PR are averaging more than 650,000 barrels of oil per day in production. The ExxonMobil-led consortium has plans in place to grow production capacity to more than 1.3 million BPD by the end of 2027, when they anticipate having all six projects up and running offshore. This will include the addition of the Yellowtail, URO and Whittail projects. Moreover, Exxon has already made an application to the Environmental Protection Agency for environmental authorization for a seventh project called the Hammerhead. Hammerhead was announced as Exxon's ninth commercial discovery in August 2018. The Hammerhead 1 well was drilled in a new reservoir, encountering approximately 197 feet 60 meters of high-quality oil-bearing sandstone reservoir. The well was safely drilled to 13,862 feet, 4,225 meters, depth and 3,773 feet, 1,150 meters of water. The project will target between 120 to 180,000 barrels per day, KBD. Exxon is aiming to commence production activities by 2029, following the requisite approvals. The daily production capacity being targeted for Hammerhead is significantly lower compared to the last three projects sanctioned, which each target over 200 kbd. Hammerhead 1 is located approximately 13 miles southwest of the Lisa 1 well and follows previous discoveries on the Stabroke block at Lisa, Lisa Deep, Kiara, Snoke, Turbot, Ranger, Hakora and Longtail. Notably, while Exxon is hoping to get approval for the Hammerhead project by mid-2025, Vice President, VP Bharat Jagdeo has said that he had discontinued an advertisement initiated by the Ministry of Natural Resources seeking a consultant to review ExxonMobil's field development plan, FDP, for the Hammerhead development. He said he made this decision because the information the company presented thus far is incomplete. Meanwhile, the EPA has advanced its part in relation to the application that was made by EMGL for environmental authorization for its seventh project. On November 6, EPA published the terms and scope to guide the preparation of the Environmental Impact Assessment, EIA, for the Hammerhead development.